Okay. I'll let the conversation stand. Uh, I do want to obviously thank the organizers. It's been a, a super stimulating, fantastic session. Um, so I'm super excited to present for you guys today. Uh, I'm talking about ways of conceptualizing decision making and action as being the same thing. And then after our conversation last night over beers, I realized I shouldn't be using either of those words because maybe they can note the wrong concepts. So we'll see how well I, I, I navigate this treacherous topic. Um, uh, so after seeing Heather's talk, I really wish I would have put more time into my outline slide, but I have this like repulsion against outline slides ever took I, ever since I took Jody Collins grad course and she's like never have an outline slide. It's totally redundant. In this case, though, I am talking specifically about uh, trajectory trajectories, how we use trajectories, how we analyze trajectories. We've seen lots of uh, interesting examples already, but I'm, I'm talking about three different things, how we analyze them some recent work we've been doing to try and actually computationally model the production of trajectories in the light of what Deepar was talking about. And then what do we do next? So Antonia's already showed some fantastic things that we can imagine going on into the future. Uh, along the way in the talk, I'm gonna try and identify key papers and key people that have contributed to the work I'm showing you today. A lot of this started when uh, Jason Gallivan and I were grad students at Western with Mel and Jody. So uh, a lot of this early work, especially uh, Jay was a, a big part of. So what's the case study I want to present to you guys today? Well, it's explained in this paper. I'm mostly going to be flashing these slides up so that you guys can check them out later. Uh, and this paper was specifically designed because we read Paul's work on the affordance competition hypothesis and got super excited and said, how could we possibly see this behavior in humans? And by that behavior, I mean the case where you present people with multiple targets, as Paul had shown to his monkeys, he, of course, had the advantage of being able to stick electrodes in the brain and see that there was parallel representation of motor plans. We wanted to get sort of a behavioral readout of the same thing. So that's exactly the task we did. We put up two targets to people or more than two targets. Uh, and the key was at the time they saw those targets and heard a beep, they needed to initiate a hand movement very quickly. So within about 300 milliseconds. And they didn't know which of those two targets was going to be the final target until after they started moving. Once they started moving, then the final target got selected and they were to correct and get to that position. So what do we find? Well, not surprisingly, when you just put up a single target, people can move straight towards the single target. The much more interesting case is what happens when you put up two targets and here the hand path reflects the averaging. So we thought this was a very nice behavioral correlate of an averaging of spatial trajectories such that would, that would explain the neural recordings that Paul had seen. Now this extends, of course, to cases where we're now gonna bias the trajectories by producing putting more targets, equal probable targets on one side of space than the other. So when there's more targets on the left and blue, you're hedging your bet to the left versus red and right. And vice versa, it doesn't matter where you're gonna end up, your initial trajectory is characterizing this averaging of motor plans, or at least that's how we interpreted it. But I'm not really gonna to talk to you today about this and this whole line of research that got spawned from this, a number of papers and cool things we've done of it, but instead I'm gonna take, take the approach that I think Tim and Ju Hyun were interested in is how do we actually dig into this data, this trajectory data? And can we come up with some, at least, I don't know, I'm calling them suggest, suggested rules of how we might analyze this stuff. So let's take this as the case study. Here's three trajectories. How do we analyze it? And the first thing I want to introduce us to is what's the, what I've sort of come to realize is the normalization problem, right, or the averaging problem. Of course, these trajectories are represented as matrices of numbers, positions over time, usually in three dimensions. But we sort of know that when you're moving straight and fast, it's not gonna take as much time as when you're moving slow and curvy. And so you have this fundamental problem of how are you gonna average a thing that doesn't have the same number of time points? So actually Mel and his student, Rob Whitwell, who is a contemporary of mine, have a very nice paper showing exactly why this is a huge problem. So they do it in the context of grip apertures. Imagine you're grabbing a large disc or a small disc. And the only thing that differs, let's say, for example, is the fact that to close your hand on a small disc takes longer, but everything else is the same. Well, you take those two trajectories and now you normalize them by time. And what you can actually see and what Mel, uh, Mel and Rob identified is what they call these spurious differences. Simply by stretching one of the things that was different in time to match the other thing, now all of a sudden you introduce something that wasn't there in the first place. And I'm not showing the example from the data because it's a little bit more complicated, but we got exactly the same thing in our reach trajectories. 
those ones that took longer, we were actually shifting the pattern of deviation to parts of the trajectory it did not occur in. So this is a, a very important problem that, I mean, if I ever review one of your papers and you do time normalization, you better convince me that time was not different between your conditions, because otherwise you know you're introducing known contaminants into your data. So what's my suggested rule? Well, first of all, avoid normalizing to a dimension that might differ across experimental conditions. And certainly do not normalize to one where you're reporting differences. So if you have movement time differences, which oftentimes we use, do not time normalize because you know you're gonna be introducing errors into your spatial trajectory analysis. Instead, if possible, I would say normalize to a dimension that's fixed across experimental conditions. What do I mean by that? Let's return to these trajectories. Here, I know movement time is different on green and red, but I know that reach distance is fixed. You start at a start button and you hit a screen. There's no going further. So this becomes a fixed dimension. So let's figure out how to normalize to reach distance. Now normalize, yep. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yes. You're not getting the question. I don't understand if you go back to the big problem slide, the final curve aperture is entirely different in the one that takes less time. I literally in PowerPoint took this red thing and time normalized it. Exactly the same. It takes longer than yeah. the round is small. Yeah. In the line round. This is precisely the case where you have movement time differences and by time normalizing you're introducing a difference that does not exist. The final grip aperture is entirely different no, in the red case take than this. in the green case. Take this and stretch it. But it is because you're doing a small disc versus a large disc. So measure final grip aperture, sure, but don't try to infer something about the trajectory differences based on time normalization. Uh, the, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, so move, know, movement right. is based on the touch and then wrist position is, we're not looking at wrist position. I'm looking at grip aperture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my point is that we should be normalizing the things that stay fixed. The problem, of course, is that time normalization is super easy. Space normalization is quite a lot more challenging. So how can we go about doing space normalization? Well, for that, I'm going to refer to this textbook, which uh, I was introduced to as a grad student, a, a series of approaches called functional data analysis. Uh, Jim Ramsey, who's at McGill, has done this. And we talk about our approach and how we've adapted it in a, in a 2014 review paper. So what does it look like? Well, let's take one of those trajectories and zoom in on the first few data points. So the first thing I want you to notice is this is not space normalized because as the hand is starting off, it's moving slower. And then as it speeds up, the space between points grows. So how do we approach this for space normalization? Well, we take a B, a B spline fitting procedure where we overfit the heck of our, of our data by fitting a sixth order polynomial or sixth order B spline between every two data points. We do this for the entire trajectory. And in yellow here, I'm now representing that what you will have recreated is a functional version of your reach. Now, the nice thing about it being a mathematical function is known as what is being scale invariant. You can plug in any value of Y and recover the corresponding value of X. And now you have the ability to space normalize. So now we can define it for every single point that we care about. And now we're in a position to have solved the normalization problem, at least if what you're trying to do is normalize to, to a specific dimension of space. Okay, so that's sort of my first caveat is that we need to figure out how to average these things. There's also a whole bunch of other issues of how do you clean your data and stuff that I'm not going to talk about today. Those are also interesting questions, but I'm going to move on to now you have some trajectories. What do you want to measure? I want to identify three different categories of measures. First, what I'm calling feature measures. These are single numbers extracted from an entire trajectory that do something like summarize something that has a, ha happens at a specific point in time or space. The other end of the spectrum, we have functional uh, measures, which actually try to do something by showing you an analysis across the entire time series. And then finally, in the middle, functional features, which are single numbers that only exist or try to capture something about the entire time series. So it's sort of in the middle there. So first, before I bring up some of the feature measures I want to talk about, I want to say that um, there's a, a whole bunch of features, right? We've seen a bunch of them in this session, um, and I'm only going to talk about a few of them because I'm more interested in the functional measures, but I, I, I want to say that I, I realize that this is like sort of woefully inadequate. But really, a lot of our measures are derived from the position in space. And so, for example, we might say, oh, well, halfway through the trajectory, what was your hand doing? And then we'd measure your lateral deviation, right? 
So we saw Jeff talking a little bit about, you basically could translate this into a maximum departure from a straight line or a maximum departure from center or whatever you want to call it. They're all fundamentally based on where is my hand in space at a particular moment in time or space. Uh, this has also been converted to a global angle measure, which is actually the same, but some people like to report angles instead. So now you're just measuring at a specific point in time relative to where I started. What is my angle of the hand path doing? One that's slightly more interesting is a local angle. So between some two time points, this is like, where am I pointing at this particular moment in time? You just draw a line between any two time points. Here I'm showing two time points extracted from later in the trajectory and you calculate the angle between those two time points. Again, so this one, for example, would have a very straight global angle, but it has a quite acute local angle because it's heading back towards the target. Okay, so those are the features I'm gonna look at right now. Like I said, there's a ton more, there's variability. One thing I'm not mentioning at all is when you go to the derivatives of space. So when you're talking about velocity and acceleration, these, these principles of normalization and things don't necessarily hold, those are, other domains that I'm not going to talk about, but maybe that's something we can talk about in the discussion. But at least as you can see this approach, which is let's take one number to stand in for some differences. In terms of a suggested rule around these, I would say you, if you're going to do this approach, be very theoretical about where and when you select your features, right? And so um, if we're going to talk about something like where was I at during my initial trajectory, initial heading, we got hammered by reviewers until we went all the way back to a point in time that was less than 100 milliseconds. So people want to see before any online correction mechanisms could kick in, lower estimates are usually around the 100 millisecond barrier. So depending on your percent movement time or whatever, this is usually kind of like in the 10 to 20% of movement range. But I would rather translate it to time. We felt pretty empirically secure doing this. If you're going to pick one point in time or space for a maximum difference, if you look, to, look at our review paper, it's almost always between 50 to 60% of movement is where you will see the biggest difference in these kinds of reach trajectories. Um, but one thing I'm sort of questioning is, should we be allowed to peak pick from our data? So in ERP or EEG analysis, we will say, within a window, what was the biggest? This is akin to what Jeff did yesterday to say, what's my maximum curvature? I don't care where it happened. I think it's a legitimate approach, but I also think we're loading the deck to find something in that particular example. And so I, you know, I'm a little bit hesitant to say that that's the best way forward, but it's, all, it's something that we can do and can consider. Okay, so that, that's my sort of talking about individual features. The next one is functional features. So these single numbers that do a good job of capturing some aspect of the entire trajectory. Heather introduced us to my favorite one, which is reach area. You just take the difference between two curves sum it up across time and generate an estimate of area. Okay, so here between green and blue might look like that. Here in orange between green and red. Finally in purple between blue and red. These then capture some aspect of how much did these things differ across the entire trajectory. And it's a nice approach and it's been uh, very successful for us as quantifying those differences. Uh, another nice approach with reach area, again, Heather talked about this, is if you have the same exact stimuli where people end on both the left and right, then you can actually take the global area between those two trajectories when you're reaching left and right as a measure of confidence or competition. So when you move straight towards targets, you get these big Vs. When you move and you're kind of uncertain about what you do, you get small Vs. And so this becomes a nice index, I think, of overall competition across conditions. Now I want to pause here and say that what neither of the functional features nor the individual features do is tell you anything about when any of this stuff is happening. So you're actually missing out on the richness of the trajectory data because you're just saying like, yeah, they're different, but you're not telling me anything about when they're different. Okay, so that's really the, the, the power of the truly functional approach. The last functional feature I'll talk about, this is getting a lot of traction right now, is what are the so-called changes of mind. Changes of mind are actually terribly quantified. They literally just draw a line up the middle and say whatever side you ended opposite, sorry, whatever side you ended up on, did you ever cross the other side of midline for some sufficient amount of time? And sufficient amount of time here is very little. And then you just count up how many times that happened. Now it's not very good, I think, because in one case, uh, you can imagine this blue trajectory has lots of competition, but we'd say there was no change of mind. And yet here, where there's a mass amount of competition, like probably an erroneous original reach, that's got the same change of mind as that red one. 
So it's kind of binarizing what I think is not a, a binary problem. So I think we need a better way. And again, I would argue that the functional approach is probably the best way to understand these things. Okay, so let's chair those functional approaches. Uh, the easiest one for me, and, and certainly what I would always argue my, get my students to do, is just plot me the mean with the, with the confidence interval, and then let's start thinking about how these things look different. Okay, so this is that same data, but with the confidence intervals added back in. Of course, the question then becomes, what is the appropriate confidence interval to use? I traditionally use repeated measures design. I traditionally show these confidence tubes, they're actually three-dimensional, um, as the average within subject standard error. Now, Paul and I had a conversation about this last night. There's, you could also bootstrap to estimate your confidence interval. There are different ways. I, I'm not really saying any one is better or worse than the other. This one has been quite successful at visually capturing the statistical differences that we report. So I think it's been a, a useful heuristic. Okay, so, so confidence intervals, I think, do visually what we actually want to do analytically. And that is, for a particular pair of trajectories, we actually just want to take those two trajectories calculate the difference between those two trajectories, and then look at how the difference evolves in time. So those of us who know our statistics, if I show you a difference plus the standard error of the difference, I'm just doing a t-test. And so the nice thing about doing this is that this is what you could call a functional t-test, right? At every point in time, you're literally saying, is that difference significantly different than zero or not? And what's cool is now for the first time by doing these truly functional approaches, we now start to get an indication of when and for how long and to what magnitude these effects are evolving across time. So the first to the last significant point, the duration of significance, so on and so forth. Okay, so maybe it's not gonna be surprising if we can do a functional t-test, then we should also be able to extend this to a functional ANOVA, right? An ANOVA with two, uh, two levels is, is equivalent to a t-test. So here's a nice three-dimensional picture of trajectory differences. This was a, a display where participants were reaching and there was all four corners of a square versus one missing. When one's missing, the hand moves both to the left and down. So now we're gonna do two different dimensions of functional ANOVA. We can see in both the lateral dimension and the vertical dimension, these things are different. And here we show you the entire trajectory functional result as sort of the opacity of this uh, purple bar where we can see initially there's the same, then they get highly significantly different and then they come back together. Right, so this is equivalent again to, this is equivalent to the functional t-test, but we can extend that to be a functional ANOVA comparing across multiple means, not just two. And when we do that, then we can get some sort of functional result that looks like this, where it's telling you there's a significant difference between these three things now across all of y distance, and then maybe like they converge at the end. Okay, so it's the exact same approach as the functional t-test, but now you've extended it to multiple means. And I would say there's a nice paper out of uh, Mike Masson and Daniel Bubb's lab in Victoria where they've actually extended this framework, it's not the exact same statistical tools, to hand orientation, right? So 3D rotations are really hard and really complicated, which is part of the reason I haven't done them. Um, this, this paper ha has actually figured out a way to do a functional analysis approach of 3D orientation. It's very sophisticated, but it's very nice if you're, very, if you're interested in these subtle rotational postural differences in hands. Okay, so my suggested rule for functional analysis, and this one is probably of all of the rules, the one that I would jump up and down about the most is, if you're going to analyze the entire time series, so you're gonna do uh, a difference over time, or you're gonna do a functional little bit, you have to show me the entire functional result. What you cannot do, or what is statistically the worst thing to do is plot it yourself, pick the one time point where it looks really good, and then make a bar plot and show me that bar plot. You have completely violated all of statistics by doing like a million tests and then picking the one good one, right? So the criticism of this work is that I am still doing a million tests, but my point is, look, I'm not actually analyzing at the unit of a single number, I'm analyzing at the unit of a single function. So I need to show you an entire functional result and then you can make sense of it. Okay, so one of the most exciting techniques that I haven't actually published with, but I've been playing around with is a technique that I'm calling functional regression. That's my term, not theirs. Surprisingly, it came up pretty much in the same issue as our original paper, and somehow I missed it for like three years. Uh, but these guys have developed a very nice technique of functional regression. So one of the limitations of ANOVA, is you can go to factorial designs to start teasing out the different dimensions along which your stimuli might differ, but actually maybe a regression is a more appropriate technique. 
Uh, this has been nicely shown in a psych science paper in 2015. That's the example I'm going to run, run through. So this was the task. In the first half of the task, you got pictures of food, about 160 of them. And for every single one, you told me how it rated on two different dimensions, how tasty you thought the food was and how healthy you thought the food was. So I've got two dimensions, and that's the key here. In the actual part two of the experiment where we're going to get trajectories, you are doing a mouse task. You just have to click on your favorite foods. You might get a trajectory that looks like this. From a functional regression standpoint, what we do is we use that local angle measure I talked about before, and now we do it at every point in time. I'm just highlighting this one point. This is still a functional analysis. And you fit it to a regression equation such that the angle at every point in time is a combination of how much this beta for taste, and that's what you're trying to uh, estimate, times this delta for taste, which is all defined in a second, and the same thing for the health. So here simultaneously two dimensions are being represented, just like a standard regression. And what you're actually predicting on every trial or, or putting in is the rating that you gave the food on the right minus the rating that you gave the food on the left along both dimensions. So what's really cool about this is when you run this through, what you get is a functional result of how did that beta weight change over the entire trajectory. And in this particular example, it's super compelling because you see that you are pulled towards the tasty option earlier and much stronger for the entire trajectory, but the healthy option does start to exert an in, a small influence on you later on in the region. So this, I think, is going to be the best technique we have going forward. For example, when I saw Heather's data on the shock, where you've got exactly two dimensions and exactly two dimensions that you want to look at, using functional regression is most likely to give you sort of, I think, the true evolution of how the hand is being pulled across time. So I'm certainly excited about, um, about using this. Okay, so that's the end of my part about analysis. So I'm gonna move into uh, what I think is sort of even more exciting and more important, which is it's nice to have these sort of um, measurement tools in our toolbox, but I think we need some nice theoretical tools before I get the last one. Can I just, yes. is that milliseconds? Uh, this is normalized time. So these guys committed the cardinal sin, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, so I want to say I want to have a, a theoretical tool in my toolkit, right? A, a computational model that can help me to understand what's going on in the reach trajectories. And much of this work has been pioneered by my grad student, Nathan Wispinski. So we've been working on this for a number of years. We've also got a couple of review papers coming out that are in this general vein, and H Reviews Neuroscience that I wrote with Jay, Daniel Wolpert, and Randy Flanagan, and another one that uh, Nathan, Jay, and I wrote. Both of these are accepted and will be coming out this year, and I think certainly this last one is, is a lot of what we've been drawing on. Okay, so uh, I can't tell this story without introducing Jim Enns, my postdoc supervisor, and I would literally have this meeting with Jim Enns. It was like a bad dream. I'd go into his office and then I'd sit down with him and, and invariably at some time he'd just be like, but why do you need reach trajectories? Why don't you just do reaction time, right? This is classical psychology. Lots of when we're talking about competition effects, they're available in reaction times. Why do we need reach trajectories? And so I think I finally convinced Jim um, and hopefully I convince you today why I think reaching matters, but it's actually an important question for all of us because sometimes simpler is better, and, and, and that is definitely something that we get away with, get, get ahead of ourselves with new and complicated methods. Okay, so I'm gonna turn to evidence accumulation models of decision-making to help make sense of, of how we're at modeling reach trajectories. So in a canonical evidence accumulation, you think you have a number of options. Most classically, this is an RDK task, but we're actually trying to, I think, do slightly more interesting decisions like between things not moving dots. This is represented by some noisy distribution. In this case, this might be in a value case, uh, value space in the RDK, it might be movement. And these distributions get sampled from over time, right? You acquire a sample, how much do I like this thing right now? Or how many dots do I think is moving to the right right now? You multiply this by some sensitivity parameter that essentially just translates it into some sort of neural space. You then add up each of these samples over time. That's why it's called accumulation. We think there's some delay, this thing doesn't get into the system immediately, and then you just see when does one of them hit a threshold. Here I'm showing a race model, later I'll show a diffusion model, but the principle is roughly the same. When does some value hit a threshold, and then we're going to call that reaction time. Okay, so that's like sort of the bedrock evidence accumulation. Uh, but it doesn't work particularly, or sorry, it, and it works particularly well at prediction re reaction time distributions and choice accuracies. Really, really well. Like, it's actually crazy how well these models do. 
The problem is, and uh, you know, pertinent to this session, of course, is that actually what people are measuring are response times, right? It's not just reaction time. It just happens to be that for button presses, vocal responses, whatever you want, the movement time is so small that they just factor it up. But what happens, and what I'm fundamentally interested in, is when you take real movements that elapse on the scale of at least as long as reaction time, if not longer, what's going on with the competitive process? What's going on? How can that explain our movements? This is even, uh, uh, this is even more relevant when we take, uh, consider the go before you know task. This was the task I showed you off the top where you had to start moving before you know which one. Here we're intentionally making you go as fast as you can. And now we're pushing all of or as much of the competition as we can into the movement. What's gonna happen? So this is really where Nathan picks up the, the charge and he says, okay, we're gonna try and model this in an evidence accumulation framework. Now we have these two options, they're unfilled circles. We assume that when you don't know anything about which one is more likely, you're not actually accumulating any evidence in favor of one or the other. And the critical component here, and this is like sort of the key innovation that I think we've had, is that in addition to this process, we're saying there is also a motor competition and accumulation process. So these motor, competing motor representations are mutually inhibitory. That's super important because the motor system needs to drive itself to a solution in a way that the decision space does not. You need your hand to get to a target. You can't kind of just hang out here forever. So there's got to be something that pushes these two things apart. <clears throat> um, and so we think that these competing motor representations then each have a corresponding reach angle and it's their weighted average that would produce a uh, direction of movement. And so I just want to note here that at the at the start, we can actually build in something that looks like affordance by saying that even though there's no evidence in favor of either option, you're in an experiment where you've reached towards these things like a hundred times. So it makes sense that both of them would be positively competing as potential targets. Okay, so that was the model that we built, really simple. It's got three parameters. Um, and so what happens in this model when you turn this light on, so now this is the person has started moving. Okay, no, there's no need for us to actually model reaction time here. We just say, look, you haven't done any accumulation prior to movement onset. Now there's this delay. Okay, the initial reach angle predicts that you're going to head up the middle. As the evidence starts to flow in for the leftward target, you can see very quickly there's only a little bit of evidence up here, but already the reach angle is being driven towards the left target really hard. This is that mutual inhibition kicking in, and then very quickly you end up uh, converging to the correct solution. So how well does our model do on that data set that I showed you before? The answer is pretty well. So this is a model that doesn't build in anything about biomechanics, anything about velocity profiles, nothing, just that the reach angle is a weighted average of sort of the amount of evidence accumulated for both options and it does a, it does a really nice job of capturing most of the features of this data. So how does it work now when we go outside of this thing where I'm hammering you and making you react, basically reaction time is irrelevant? Okay, so now we're going to flesh out the entire model. We're going to do a value-based decision. We're going to add in some parameters that allow you to have biases either towards particular targets or towards particular sides of space. Now we add in the diffusion component. This is what's going to dictate reaction time. When the difference in evidence between your two options hits some bound, either positive towards one or negative towards the other, that's going to determine your reaction time. This is classic drift diffusion evidence accumulation models, okay? This is, we just took exactly the shell off the shelf and, and did exactly that. But critically, at the same time, in parallel, all of this evidence is also feeding into this competitive motor representation space, such that at any instant in time, okay? So uh, a cool example is the startle response. If I was to shoot a gun, you can launch a movement way before your RT was ready, but your motor preparation would predict in what direction that move movement would be launched. Okay, and so here you hit this bound when red is just slightly ahead, so you're gonna be biased slightly towards the right. But what happens later in this model, of course, is that the blue evolves in time as you are reaching, such that now we can account for the case where you start heading in one direction and change your mind. So this particular trial would look like this as modeled in completeness, you would start moving towards red and you would change your mind as the evolving evidence pushed you back towards blue. 
Uh, I'm really excited about this model because it automatically accounts for changes of mind and indirect reaches. By that, I mean reaches that start heading up the midline in a way that I don't think any other model that we've come across can do, but I'm not as familiar with DMARC, so he might be able to do it. Uh, and also, most importantly for me, it's like it validates all those hours I spent in Jim's office. Because I think we can actually show that reaches do matter for showing the evolution of competition after reaction time. But of course, the model should be put to the test. So we actually tested this in some data. This experiment was super simple. You got pictures of chips and chocolate bars hundreds of times, and you were told to reach out and choose the one you wanted. This is a mocap set up with a projector, so it feels like a big touch screen. Um, and so you did this a lot, and then it, we motivated you because I put boxes of chocolate bars next to you and bags of potato chips. And I said, randomly, I'm going to choose two of your trials. Whatever you chose on those two trials, you're going to walk out with. So people were motivated to be consistent. And then at the end of the experiment, we just asked people to rank how much they liked each, each of these things so that we can categorize three decision types. An easy decision between the thing you like the most and the thing you like the least. A medium decision between ones that differ by two ranks and a hard decision between all things that only differ by one rank, right? This could be a harder decision. So how does our model do? Well, first of all, we're taking an off-the-shelf drift diffusion model, so it better do a good job at predicting reaction time, and it does. So you are slower to react on a hard decision than on an easy decision. It better also do a pretty good job on predicting choice accuracy, because again, that's drift diffusion modeling, and the answer is it does. You uh, aren't as consistently choosing your preferred option when it's hard versus easy. Interestingly, I'm separately plotting here where did you initially move towards versus where did you end up. That suggests that sometimes you change your mind. This is excitingly what this model can account for that traditional uh, drift diffusion models cannot account for, and that is the percent of changes of mind. So here we see you change your mind much more often on hard trials than easy trials, but what is fascinating about changes of mind in general when you change your mind, you're doing it for the good. You're starting heading down the wrong way, and then you're changing your mind to the correct way, and our model can successfully capture this. Now, actually what I'm the very most excited about is that we're actually able to create individual trajectories for individual participants and see, even just eyeball test how well they do, and the answer is pretty well. Here's one subject, so you can see this person's pretty straight and committed on easy, pretty curvy and conflicted on hard, we capture that. Here's a second person who's actually pretty straight and committed all the time, and our model successfully captures that. So where I, you know, where I thought, I, I actually added this slide in because Heather showed how she can get people who move straight and consistent versus people who don't, and the model can capture that, right? It's someone who's willing to start before the competition is resolved versus someone who's starting to will, willing to start only after the competition is quite resolved, and it all falls out. Okay, so last, I only have five minutes, but hopefully this doesn't take longer than that. Last project is a, a, a big applied collaborative project that if you would have asked me four years ago if I would have been doing this, I would have said no, but it's been super exciting and super rewarding. So we're part of the DARPA Haptics program. Uh, this is, if you've ever been to a DARPA meeting, it's like you're going into a science fiction novel. This particular program is using implantable electrodes to both stimulate and record motor movement patterns to return motor function via uh, uh, electrodes, but also the sense of sensation back via the like four sensors in the peripheral device return neurally to the user. That's an amazing, crazy work. The problem is, to be totally honest, these people have no idea how to assess whether or not these very subtle differences are changing motor performance. So that's where we step in. How can we design new, more sensitive assessment tools to tell you the difference between when your sensory feedback is turned on versus turned off. That's a potentially very subtle difference, but I think with some of the approaches we've taken here, we can get there. So the key paper here is just accepted a, the first eye tracking analysis we've done of our new approach. But the, the first point I want to make is that if you look at the kind of data we record in our, in our lab, so this is similar to what Antonia is doing with simultaneous eye tracking and motion tracking. You and I can do a decent job of making sense of the biological motion, but we do a terrible job. If I asked you what is the person looking at and this is all you got, you'd have no idea. Conventional eye tracking analysis, well now you re require you to go video frame by frame, what was the perfect person looking at? We've done that to validate that we can do it and it took my grad students and RAs literally thousands of man hours to do it for 20 people, 60 trials. It is impossible. 
So I'm excited to show you guys this. This is a gaze and movement assessment tool. This is a, a piece of software that we've designed in MATLAB where if you feed in synchronized eye and motion tracking data, we've enabled you all of the tools to build this. Okay, so this is a fully rendered three-dimensional representation of the environment, the moving body, but most importantly, the three-dimensional gaze vector. Where is that person looking with respect to real objects in the environment? I cannot stress how hard this is to do if you don't have some kind of tool like this. Even more importantly, you'll notice that sometimes that past box was turning red every time the gaze vector intersected it. It is automatically identifying those periods of fixation. So this is literally, we load up our data, we define our world, and we say apply this to all of our trials. When we do that, we start with the kinematics of the hand in past box, we subdivide automatically, again, this is automatically labeled from the kinematic data, what are each of the movements, and further, what are each of the subphases of each movement, the reach, the grasp, the transport, the release. Automatically, these labels are assigned to each movement. We then define areas of interest. Are you looking at where you're going, where you're going next, or are you looking at your hand? And again, based on that 3D gaze vector, we can automatically tell you when are you fixating each of those objects, subdivided at a level of detail that has never been seen before. When are you looking at that object? When you're reaching to it. When are you looking at that object? When you're about to put it down. We've defined a, a, a series of eye-hand latency measures that are locked to the movement of the object. How much in advance of the object moving do your eyes arrive at both when you pick it up and put it down, as also when do they leave. We're able to consistently measure that your eyes get towards the object about 500 milliseconds, but see uh, important biomechanical differences, like when you need to turn your head, your eyes don't lead your hand nearly as much. So interesting patterns of behavior. Why is this relevant? Well, I, I told you it's in the context of that DARPA haptics program. Here's an able-bodied individual performing this task. This is what you get out of the eye tracker natively. This is what the mocap looks like. This is what our rendering of it looks like. Well, let's see what a prosthetic limb patient does. And this is why I think this technique is going to be particularly uh, relevant. This prosthetic limb patient, you'll notice, moves fundamentally differently, but look what his eye gaze does. It stays locked on the hand and object the entire time he's moving this box because he doesn't have any proprioceptive feedback from that box. His only information about a successful grasp is that it's acquired visually. So this, it, you get this kind of data automatically generated for every person who runs in this particular task. I'm not gonna go through all of it. I'm gonna highlight the one difference. You and I, when we do this task, we look at where we're gonna put that box down about 80% of the time, way ahead of, as soon as we've got it, we're looking ahead. Prosthetic limb patient spends at least half the time looking at his hand and less than half the time looking where he's going. If I turn that prosthetic limb patient's sensory motor feedback back on, we make the strong prediction that he's gonna shift in this direction. So this we think is the right level of sensitivity that's needed if you're gonna analyze this. Okay, so I'm gonna end with what I think I'm the most excited about. So simultaneous recording eye and motion tracking is challenging. Building the software tools to analyze it is even more challenging, but I think we've solved that problem. And what I'm really excited about now is that we can simultaneously also record neural recordings from EEG. So as a proof in principle, here's my, uh, fanciest video. This is someone performing that same task, but now I'm showing you the simultaneously recorded EEG overlaid on their head in real time. The ability to analyze this data, and I don't know why it's not me, it's supposed to be me. Um, the, the ability to, to automatically segment your movement data and your eye tracking data means that we can assign labels to this EEG data that are automatically generated based on the behavior. And if anyone's a machine learning expert, that's really exciting because labeled data is the holy grail of machine learning. And here I'm saying, look, we're going to use automatically identified labels based on how the hand is moving and what the eyes are doing to interpret the patterns that we see in the EEG data. So I'd like to thank, of course, all the places that I've been, Western, UBC, now I'm at U of A. Um, CFAR is an organization that I've had a, a great affiliation with for the last couple of years. But of course, my grad students, I, I mentioned Nathan Ewan's work is uh, the, a lot to do the haptics project. Scott's been helping also with the combined EEG. I didn't get to talk about Jen's work, but it came up. She's doing some really cool stuff with just EEG, showing um, ways of tracking bias in the brain in EEG for brightness phenomena. And that's really cool. And, and Jeff's doing some neat stuff with looking at the value of information in reach trajectories. 
But of course, I'd like to thank you guys, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, thanks very much. It's uh, um, an almost an overwhelming detail, amount of detail on the different methods. Uh, clear uh, preferences for um, the functional anomalies. Um, and I think at the sake, for the sake of time, I'm not sure if we're going to have enough time to get into a, a good debate about the different methods. Um, uh, maybe we'll save that for another time we'll have to, and, and the papers, and I think we'll deal with some of the other more theoretical issues. Um, actually, uh, I, I have some questions, but first I wanted to just make a comment that, you know, one of the reasons I think this is exciting is because I don't see any reason why this couldn't be done, let's say, with animal research, right? And I can tell you, everyone that works with animals, like monkeys or rats, monkeys like me, we know we're doing the wrong thing in having these animals that can jump from tree top to tree top, and we have to be sitting head fixed in the room and we just get on like this. We're, and we all know that we need to go to uh, more <coughs> really moving animals, etc. But the problem with that is, is kind of what you're addressing here, that once we do that, then we have we have a chaotic mess that we cannot make sense of. And we don't have the armies of bastards that are just going to go and say. So I think the key here is that you can actually, you could actually study chronically implanted wireless recording, which all of that, all that exists. Yeah. The problem is making sense of the data. So yeah. You could automatically do the segment. So I want to I actually point to a slide that Antonia had that I thought was really nice, which showed ecological validity going this way, yeah. experimental control going this way. I've always tried to live in the middle. So I don't want to say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking at grad students jumping around treetops, right? I mean, that's not, I'm not there, but I'm taking tasks and what, so the other issue that came up, uh, I can't remember who asked the question was, how do we decide what parameters to tweak? It's been very useful to work with clinicians who say, hey, we've done this for like decades. How do we assess upper limb movement? Well, let's get people to reach lower and then have to move their body and put it up higher. So there are some movement characteristics that we've intentionally captured in those two pair or that one paradigm I showed you and we have a second one where we know it's going to be challenging for prosthetic limb patients. So it's, it's in that middle. We're, we're a 10 second trial. So it's more ecologically valid than like bite bar and a one second trial. You're moving around freely, but I'm still going to get you to do that same movement 20 times because I want to see the consistency. So I'm not ready to say I'm going to do this with people just walking around my lab, even though we're almost prepared to do that because subdividing the data is going to be hard. But if you give a task that's capturing lots of things that you're interested in and yet it's replicable and segmentable, then you're in this beautiful space where I think we have a lot of power. Just be careful about normalization. Yeah, you know, it's, it has definitely reared its head in that project too. Thank you so much, it's very exciting. It's really great. Um, in your talk and in the other talks that have used this general method, I don't recall hearing anybody mention a lot of neighbors in their 1992 psych science paper <coughs> where they said instead of just using two button presses for binary choices we should use a joystick and it's so it's one dimensional movement where they said look at how interesting and informative the kinematics are and certainly uh, <coughs> the tradition that's being uh, reflected here is echoing that view has that Method been forgotten? Do you guys know about it? Um, are there further thoughts about it? Anyway, if you don't yeah, know, no, about I, I don't know. So I'm used to lecturing at C blank stairs. Yeah. Um, but they kind of yeah. pioneered looking at lexical precision, yeah. uh, Sternberg memory scanning, and sh saying that look, you get a lot more information by looking at kinematics. And they're very sure. Yeah. That, you know, going left and going right, they look. So, do you have a specific comment about that paper? I don't have a specific comment about that paper, but like, I don't well, I see, it's, you seem so to have. There is a new specific comment about it. I am aware of that uh, paper. When I was producing, so when I started, um, I don't know even what you said the parameter rising to capture this phenomenon. So, uh, people are, there's another thing people are not aware of is that uh, Sakari, I don't know what people have. Oh, 
So when we do the collecting data through the three states and two consumption strains and and then the three D more or less uh, all of the data patterns are converging to the same In the frequency states, we do the three D varies very sensitive to us, changing information we can communicate better so we can have higher changes. Sure. I just want before you do that, I just want to pick up on that point. The only thing I would say is the closer your movements get to being ballistic, and Paul has the nicest work to show this. Where it, so so for example, you you separate your targets out so that now like it, you really have to commit to one or another. There's no in, there's no way you can be indecisive and complete the task. The, the same thing happens if you're having to move very close. As soon as you're moved towards one, then the other one becomes not an option anymore. So there are parameters that will affect the competition we're seeing that that uh, that some particular platforms like I'm worried about finger movements, although I'm interested in pursuing that and mouse movements and joystick movements, they might force you into this binary space when really it's just the method that's forcing you there. And if you allowed it to be a bit more rich, you'd see it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like, there's a comment about the variety. Some people to tell us get them to go as fast as you can because you don't want to worry about it. And we get other people who have this criticism, which is, oh, why is it you're, you're not doing everything? Or, you know, you, you're forcing all of the competition. That's not how it will happen naturally. What I'm seeing now, though, is it doesn't matter. I can let you take as much time as you want. That chips and chocolate bar a task. We say you have five seconds. People are there's no time pressure. They can move slow. They can react slow. We actually get probably more curvature in that study than we do in my other study. So it's almost as much competition because people don't, they take advantage of the extra time with the movement to resolve the competition. This is what we do naturally. And so I don't, it's, it's, it's exactly not the serial model. They are perceiving and deciding and acting all at once, all at the same time. So another interesting question, I have an issue about damage because some movement is like, uh, sometimes it's about the movement. Sure. Yeah, we are pushing time, so maybe we'll, um, We'll end with, with, with what our, and then and then maybe continue this uh, either into the break or um, later tonight. Or, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, first, just a precedence comment. So I think I mean the, the dynamics for me started with Ericsson, somewhere in Ericsson in the seventies. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure. I, I I also have issues with this with this pushing uh, thing. Uh, and again, it has been shown that the Behavior, if you force people to start without having made up their mind, is very different from if you were to give them time. And what we find, for instance, is that the kind of factors that factor into the, uh, let's say, the post decisional behavior, this is the typical distinction between reaction time and movement time, uh, that you can kind of blur by forcing people to start uh, before, the, let's say, whatever they would need to take. Can I have the reaction time is over? You you actually so so you combine the two. Now, for instance, what what we find is that um, so for instance, what what we did was uh, to, to, to manipulate the action effects and kind of have two historically there are two different camps of action effects. One is the ideal motor approach that is interested in whatever uh, the the achievement is. So how did I change the reaction? Myself and the environment by, by creating things or switching the light on, whereas the, the behaviorist uh, branch kind of hammers on uh, reward, on, on let's say emotionally uh, interesting uh, action effects, which uh, are to be not assumed to become part of the action representation, but shape action representation. That's a historically 
it's a clean version of it. Now it's, this is also blurry. Now we have manipulated both in this kind of uh, movement paradigm, and it is very clear that the, the, the effect, the effects are only, uh, the, the impact is a very, um, is very different for objectively interesting and for objectively not interesting, so like a motor uh, action impacts. Very systematic, uh, depending on the context, depending on free choice versus forced choice, and so forth and so on. So uh, I'm not saying that we fully understand that, but uh, playing around with the, with the, let's say, not leaving uh, it to the participants when to start uh, changes the game. And I'm not sure what we are measuring there because if you leave them, if you do not instruct them, they do not start. They 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 do not. They wait until they know. I, uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I think we'd have to agree to disagree. <laughs> I, I think our conversation over beers last night extends to reaction time. I don't think there's anything particularly special about reaction time. I don't think the, you know, other than a gating process to say, should I move or not, which is great. It's not telling you that the competition is resolved. That's, that's the point I want to make because what else is the change of mind other than a competition that was resolved in one way that got changed to the other way? Or what is it when I absolutely agree with you that we shouldn't force people to react? So we didn't, and we still get a ton of competition and 10 to 20% changes of mind when you're deciding between chocolate bars that you have a very clear and consistent preference for. It's like 95% of the time you're choosing a dairy milk. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think I have to agree to disagree. I, I don't think there's anything particularly special about that with respect to how the competition is evolving. Okay, then let's take the crucial question. How does that fit with the, with the, with the milk on the milk? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, 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 so I, yep. memory related yep. stuff yep. must not impact, according to my reading, must not impact the, the execution of the, of the, of the action. No, I don't, I, so I don't have that interpretation of Mulder and Goodell and maybe Mel, Mel can speak to that, but, but I absolutely, <coughs> Paul's model where action selection and action specification are happening in parallel and features like reward or value or a hedonistic response can factor into a movement at different time scales, absolutely can explain what's going on very easily. So I, I don't see a, and the initial volley of information is going priorly to pick up the movement signatures. It's then getting the frontal cortex, picking up value signatures, feeding back into visual cortex, and the whole system starts again. There's beautiful work. There's like a 2013 PNAS paper by the last author, Stanisor, that shows reward processing in V1, initial volley, not recurrent volley at about 100, 125 picks up the reward signature. So it all fits. I mean, it does, it's just, it's that the time scales over which it's operating have to be factored into how we think these biases affect movement. So we do have an agreement here that memory based processes impact the execution of actions until the end. Is that what we have? Sorry, I don't, I, I have to give you the same again. Okay. That memory based processes. So, so what, what do you ventral, mean by memory based? Ventral functions. Well, I mean, I, I, look, I'm not a ventral stream researcher, so I can't well, say where, where, where is it stored that I like dairy milks more than Doritos? Well, when you pick up a tool, right away, yeah. So I mean, all the moral no, stuff, I'm I mean, just, it has to be I just want to make sure that we have an agreement. Well, I mean, I, I, it sounds well, like you're trying to state some empirical claim. I, I'm not so sure. I, all I know is that the initial volley is likely processed on like sort of exclusively dorsal stream. It can then pick up signatures via the interconnected pathways that Paul has so nicely shown to start biasing that influence. And I, I've argued since my PhD thesis, the right way to poison the stream if you want to affect all future behaviors is to do it at the source. And it goes back to V1 for visual motor tasks and starts to taint or bias the processing in V1. This is why we get attention signatures in V1 that are tied to movement. I don't think it's instantaneous. I think it takes time, and I think it takes different amounts of time based on where you think the bias is coming from. If it's a complicated memory-based something, maybe it needs to pick up that signal eventually, and maybe it's much slower, so maybe it wouldn't affect all movement. So I don't want to say definitively, you know, this is what I think, but can my experience with the world affect my movements? Well, as Mel just said, of course it can. Tool use is the canonical example. How else am I deciding to pick up a thing like this if it's not some sort of memory? I wonder if I just make a comment, sort of maybe a little bit in agreement with the fact that, that there may be differences between these kinds of classical psychological experiments where, where people are not to, not to do anything and then do something versus the situation of like a, 
a soccer player uh, making decisions while engaged in very complicated ongoing activity. But if there are those differences, then that just argues that we should be studying the soccer <coughs> player and not the person sitting in this artificial laboratory situation. Because many of our models, for example, like, like these rise to threshold models that, that I do as well, um, they might fall apart in a condition where you're already above threshold because you're already moving your legs and arms and making decisions on the fly. And, and, and I, I actually were trying in my lab now to do tasks about deciding while acting just to see what those differences are. So and I just put off this video. So, so my, my grad students spent like eight hours looking through um, this BBC series to find exactly this case that Paul has shown cartoon based. Uh, many times. But look at this. What, what is this? This is averaging behavior because the animal is trying to, you know, I mean, one way of interpreting, but I totally couldn't agree more, right? I mean, you have to put people in the right context to see these kinds of things. It's a view yeah. so, you think yeah. this is representative of I mean, I think this is representative of a nice. <laughs> so if, nice we watch, if we watch her video, then we see this. Okay. Sorry, I'm not sure. You seem to, I just think it's a problem. Okay, so on this uh, point of agreement, disagreement, agreement, and more agreement, Isn't it nice great, video, right? uh, I, I, I'm sorry, this has been a great discussion. But you have to draw it to a close to, to maintain some kind of schedule and, and for other kinds of breaks, I'm sure. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll break now and we'll reconvene in 10 minutes or so. So thank you very much for all the presenters.